Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here at History Lens with <laughs> Professor John David Ann of HPU. And today we have, a, oh, the, the beginning of a special series about parties in American right, history. That's right. Parties. Oh, that's I'm right. so excited to learn about this. <laughs> I don't think we paid enough attention. And we, well, you know, we see Republicans and Democrats and we, we think that's forever. It's not forever. Right. It that's hasn't right. been forever. That's right. Yeah. So can, can yeah. you, um, you know, tell us, uh, starting with the end of the, what, 18th century, yeah, how parties have developed in this country? Right. So it's really the beginning of the 18th century and political parties developed. Um, the idea of a party developed around, in England, around opposition to the king. So, so during uh, the late uh, 17th century, in the 1680s, then uh, the parliament, which had been put upon and dispensed and, you know, burned, bombed, and all of these, you know, abuses of, of the parliament and its power had been, uh, you know, enacted in England in the, in the 1600s. Then, and of course, for a while, you have Cromwell, a dictator, actually. You don't have any parliament at all in that time period. And so... Um, in the 1680s, then, uh, you have a new monarch and you have the reinstitution of parliamentary power. And this is really the first time that England has what I would call a kind of a, a semi-functioning democracy with a, a separation of powers with a, with a king and with a parliament that has separate powers, although it's not really, I mean, I, it's really a stretch to call it a democracy because the truth is that the king controlled a lot of the seats in the parliament. There were a lot of seats in the parliament that weren't elected at all. They were just chosen among the king's favorites or rich people. So it's it's a very it's a pretty ugly democracy. It's an early version. It is. If you will. It is. Yeah. But let me yeah. let me ask Let's you go. this: is yeah. really this is an interesting, very provocative thing from what you just said. It yeah. sounds to me like parties or however you call them, yeah. factions, parties, right. Right. are an element in building democracy. That, that, and, and you think about it, gee, every democ democratic country you've heard yeah. of yeah. has parties. Yeah. So therefore, they must be somehow part of the firmament there. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the political parties in England developed based upon, again, upon opposition to the king, and they're really, um, they're not really political parties in the modern sense. Um, they're... They're, or, they're people who are organizing themselves around particular issues, you know, opposition to the king, concern about corruption, concern about tyranny. Um, pushback. Pushback, yeah. I mean, there's a kind of general kind of, you know, we, we don't like what's going on. And so th and this was called the Whig Party in England. And they were, they were uh, both opponents, the radical Whigs were opponents of the king, and then and then conservative Whigs were actually allies of the king. So it's, it's not like a, a, a modern political party at all, but it was based upon people dividing into groups that we could call factions. On, on two okay. sides of the aisle, on multiple sides of the, the aisle. It yes. wasn't just two, it could be more than that. It could be more, but really in terms of the, the kind of the politics of that time period, it was really those who opposed the king. Mm -hmm. and those who supported the king. And mm -hmm. that's really how you can divide it up. Uh, and that, that idea of a political party came into the colonies through the writings of the, the opposition Whig leaders. They were, these, these writings were very popular in, in the 13 colonies. And, and, uh, and so the, the, the colonists actually absorbed a lot of these so-called radical Whig oppositionists a lot of their ideas, and it's, it's quite frankly part of what drives the American Revolution, the rebellion against the king, is this opposition in England that's been getting, you know, it's coming across the Atlantic and getting uh, a lot of traction. Yes, you can speak yeah. against the king. That's exactly. This is not a forever thing you can speak <laughs> against the king. <laughs> exactly. And maybe you shouldn't have a king. <laughs> Uh, well, it, but, but when, you, when you can speak against the king, it means the king's power is not absolute. Right. No, that's right. And that was the agreement in 1688 by which Parliament retook its powers, that the king's power would not be absolute. Although, like I say, it's, it's an enormous power. But so, so factions, really, it's, uh, 
I hesitate to use the word faction for the Whigs, although there are factions. I guess there are factions within the Whigs. But then what happens is in the 13 colonies, the American Revolution takes place. There's considerable uni uh, unity around the idea of overthrowing the British, although there's about 20% of the American population that thinks, no, no, it's a bad idea. We should stay loyal to the king. So even there, there are factions. But then it's really after the revolution in the 1790s when there's real tension within the revolutionary leaders, especially Jefferson and Adams, representing two very different views of uh, the American, uh, you know, the American future and, and, and a vision for what the United States should be. So, so those two different views are there. And, uh, and here they are building a constitution it, it, so with a moving target. Parties well, are not really well, settled. Well, that's, so the constitution is one of the things that creates the factions, uh -huh. actually. It's disagreement about the, various the, parts of the constitution. Say, yeah. Should you have a constitution with a strong leader? Should you have a constitution with a, a president for life, which is kind of what, actually what Hamilton endorses at yeah. one point. Hamilton is part of this uh, 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 this what we call the Federalist faction, which is Adams, Hamilton, Washington, George Washington was Washington was a part of that faction, uh, and then you have the Jeffersonians, Thomas Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. You know, so you have these. The Federalists were more like um, supporting the king or supporting the president. Well, they, they the didn't other, like kings, but yeah, they wanted a powerful presidency. Powerful president. They were concerned about things in Europe, so they wanted a powerful government. Yeah. That could that could defend itself the against Jeffersonians against were the, the Europeans, other side of that. and the Jeffersonians were very concerned about tyranny, and they didn't want a powerful president because they believed a powerful president would march us into tyranny. A strong man would march us into tyranny. So I mean, you know, <laughs> there are some echoes of the present day in 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 this Jeffersonian concern about so tyranny. It, when they set up the Constitution and yeah. balance of power, which yeah. is a which is a term that is so important today right <laughs> um they had to be thinking about this they had to be thinking about how parties would be treated in the legislature how parties would be treated as yep. a you know for or against <laughs> the president right um and the whole no, thing was it was, was it was spinning a new story right no there. that's that's right so that so you have the development of these factions the the hamiltonian faction and the jeffersonian faction the federalist versus the jeffersonians become called the republican democrats it, the terminology here becomes very confusing, but nonetheless, so, so that's where you get the idea of political parties. Now, they're still not official political parties in the modern sense. They don't have organizations. They don't hold conventions. So in that very early period, but Jay, it makes me think about the, so I'm going to shoot ahead to the present because it makes me think about the 2018 election, the midterm election, okay? And so the reason why we're talking about uh, parties and political parties and different uh, factions and shifts over time is that uh, it seems like the politics that brought us into uh, the 2016 election and maybe even the politics in the era of Obama, although I think we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing some shifts even, the era, even in the era of Obama, um, but, but the Obama era shift seemed to be bearing fruit, uh, fruit, not in the 2016 election so much, but in the 2018 midterm election, when, uh, when you had some Democrats elected in seemingly solid Republican era, uh, areas of the country. So, so one of the ways that these factions, or in, in our day and age, the Democrat and, and Republican Party work things out is, uh, is when you, when you think about, okay, the Democrat, the Republicans control the South, the Democrats the Northeast, the Republicans the Southwest, the Democrats the West. Okay, so there are some, there, one way to think about it is through geography. Okay, and you know, there are other ways of thinking about it. So let's just take uh, geography and urban versus rural, right? You know, that kind of suburbs, uh, Republicans, inner cities, Democrat, that kind of thing. Geography right? has a lot to do with parties. Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, one of the, the pivotal elections in the 2018 uh, midterms was Kristen Sinema's victory. Uh, she's a Democrat, and she won the Senate race in Arizona. It was a very tight race, but in the end, she won. And if we can bring up Kristen Sinema's picture 
Uh, of course, she's become quite famous for winning. There she is for winning this election. I mean, Jay, she is a very unorthodox uh, uh, politician, right? She's bisexual. Uh, she's flamboyant. Um, she's very outspoken. Um, and so uh, she's, she's not kind of uh, same old usual. But she won as a Democrat. In a Republican state. In a solidly Republican state. And she won in a geography in, a, in the Southwest where the Republicans have, have really held sway since the, the early 1970s. Um, and so this suggests that there might be some changes. I mean, not just Arizona, but you look at Colorado, it's becoming more uh, Democrat as well. I mean, the, these shifts are taking place on the basis of immigration and of uh, rising Hispanic populations, which tend to vote Democrat. But so the Sinema victory suggests there might be a shift in the kind of the same old assumptions about politics. Now, there's one other one. We'll go to one other one, and then we can. Uh, so, so the other one is uh, Connor Lamb. If we can bring Connor Lamb's picture up. There's Connor Lamb, and Lamb is a handsome guy. Uh, this guy, he won in an area which in which Donald Trump had won by 20 points in 2016. And it's in, so Pennsylvania, traditionally Democratic, but not suburbs. And the suburbs of Pittsburgh really handed uh, Connor Lamb his victory. Uh, so, so there's something going on in the Southwest in terms of a shift. There's something going on in suburbs. Uh, there's something going on in uh, younger people. So, so you're seeing some shifts in the way people in voting patterns. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially the basis for how we talk about political parties and what we call party systems mm -hmm. or party coalition. Mm -hmm. Coalition is maybe a, a better word to talk about this. Uh, it, historically, uh, we talk about these things. So, so what I'm trying to suggest here is that the 2018 midterms are, might be suggesting a, a sea change in politics, a movement towards uh, Democrats being more dominant in the next uh, 25, 30 years. But, but looking back to, yeah. say, the year 1800 or after the Constitution right. was established right. in right. those days when it was just sort of finding its way, yeah. seems to me there have been, what, dozens of parties established and, and then, you know, and then well, at the fringes, dozens. The no, and... I mean, at the fringes, dozens. But actually, no, not at the center. There have been very few political parties, actually. So you start with the Federalists and the Republican Democrats, right? This is the, okay. the party of Hamilton Adams. Okay. That's the Fed in, in Washington. That's the Federalists. And then the, uh, the Republican Democrats, that's the party of Jefferson and Madison and Monroe. And, all, you know, five out of those six are actually presidents in that first time period. And it's no coincidence that in that first time period when parties begin to develop out of these factions, these two separate factions, that in the early period, Washington is the first president, right? He wins two elections. You have, uh, you have uh, John Adams who wins an election in, and, and then, so you have two Federalists who win elections and then you have uh, Jefferson win a very highly contested election in 1800, uh, and he's a Republican Democrat, not a Federalist. And thereafter, uh, Jefferson serves two terms, uh, and then you have, uh, you have Madison winning election, he's a Republican Democrat. And then you have Monroe winning, and he's a Republican Democrat. And so by the end of this, what we call the first party system, this is the Federalists versus Republican Democrats, the Federalists can, uh, dominate early, the Republican Democrats dominate later in the party system up to 1830. You, we're sitting here talking about a party called Republican Democrats. Yeah. It, it, it gives you, uh, you know, a headache. <laughs> so which, why is that like you know, what we have now? Why is it unlike? And you know, right. it strikes me that well, one thing we can say about this yeah. is that the name that is taken by the party does not necessarily no, reflect no, their, no, that's you know, right. their views. And I things. apologize for giving you a headache. <laughs> no, no, no. It's <laughs> learning is better. Uh, okay, okay. That's why we need to take a short break. Okay, we'll take John a break. John David Ann, HBU professor of history, talking about political <laughs> parties in the United States. We'll be right back. <laughs> 
Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. You can catch me every Wednesday, alive at five. I'll see you there. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Right. As I said, you know, are we due for one? Right. Are we due for a change in, right. in parties? That's right. So let, let's go back to what right. we talked about okay. during the break, John. Right. Sure. So we, we're talking about uh, Republican Democrats, and right. you're going to help me understand what they Right. So, they okay, so the, the Republican Democrats, Jeffersonians, they favored uh, small government, limited government, sort of. I mean, Jefferson favors small government until he gets to be president. Then as president, he actually expands the power of the government. He... Uh, he uses the Navy in a brand new way to, to, uh, uh, to defeat the Barbary pirates. He, uh, uh, he, he, he decides to uh, uh, purchase the Louisiana Purchase. That's the, you know, kind of, he does these powerful things once he gets into power. He doesn't like small government quite so much once he's in power. <laughs> Isn't that always yeah, the Yeah, <laughs> that's, it seems pretty consistent. So, so small government, um, very interested in uh, uh, a farmer republic. Jefferson was very interested in what he called a yeoman farmer republic. Independent farmers who were not, uh, who didn't owe their allegiance to anybody who could vote freely, right, and, and, and would, you know, would not be influenced by faction or partisanship or the rest of it. Uh, and uh, a suspicion of tyranny, a real suspicion of like, okay, and, and that uh, exhibits itself in uh, suspicion of Northeasterners. Even as far back as the early 1800s. Why was that? What was that about? Well, because north, the Northeast is where industry develops, where capitalism develops first. So early. Yes. In the early 19th century. It's, that's right. In the early 1800s, you have the 1800s. development of uh, the same thing, that you have the development of textiles mills and other kinds of factories. And by, you know, Jefferson's time period, but even later than that, by the 1820s, then you have a small industrial revolution taking place in the Northeast. And you have it's in new kinds of money. You have a stock market that develops. You have, uh, you have a paper currency that's being used. Uh, all of these new innovations are good for some people, but they're threats to others. And, and the Republican Democrats are like, mm, this might not be the best idea. This, this could lead to uh, maybe a, a big, uh, a wealthy person dominating the political system. It, so, so they're worried about and the it influence. It sounds like of, the roots of the Civil War because slavery was an issue in that dichotomy. Well, you can trace a trajectory from the Republican Democrats to the birth of the Democratic Party in 1932, uh, pardon me, 1832. And then the Democrats, of course, become uh, really, uh, the, de the Democrats are dominant in the South. And that's really the party that leads us to the Civil War. So again, that the, uh, the, the <laughs> nomenclature is confusing. Again it is, today it is, that's right, to... that's right, that's right. <laughs> well, anyway, so, so you have these, so the, that's the Republican Democrats. The Federalists, on, on the other hand, has, uh, they like lots of power. They like a big government. Um, they like a more powerful government. Um, the Federalists established uh, uh, the National Bank. Okay, they uh, established the idea that uh, they would uh, help to run the economy through the Treasury Department. Not much, but that really is a 20th century thing, but a little bit in the early 19th century. So, so they believed that the government should be more powerful and more activist. And, and the Federalists also begin to support the idea of infrastructure projects, uh, which becomes a very big deal in the 1830s through... Uh, the, uh, running up to the Civil War in the, in the 1850s. So that's, that, that's the Federalists now. You know, right now, yeah. today, there's a Federalist Society. Well, yes, of course. Yeah, it's yeah. all about the conservative side. Yeah, yeah. The it's, uh, it's, it's, I, but it's not the same as It's it not the same. Not no, necessarily it's, related to the party. In the no, I'm sure they, they say nice things about John Adams, but in reality, it's, they, don't, they don't stand <laughs> okay. for the same things. Okay. okay. Um, so... And, and, and so uh, the, and the Federalists also favor tariffs 
That becomes a big issue in the 1830s to protect manufacturing, but tariffs really don't benefit farmers, uh, you know, plantation owners as much as they do factory owners. So, but what happens is the Federalists uh, uh, decide to, well, they have this, this struggle with the Republican Democrats in the early 1800s, and then they decide to oppose the, the War of 1812. Because they're favorable to England, the Republican Democrats are favorable to France, Wow, I can and, see some real contention there. Yeah, yeah. Because the War of 1812 was a big threat on, it, the, on it, the then the, very young United that's States. That's right. So the British are continuing to attack and impress uh, American sailors and, Washington. And, and, and merchantmen. That's right. And so eventually the United States declares war against Great Britain. But the Federalists are saying no, no, because they want to make an alliance with Great Britain, not to be at war with them. And so, and what happens is there's a kind of war fever that develops in the country. The Federalists lose a lot of support, and the Federalists begin to disappear as a party in the 1820s then. Because okay. they were linked to this whole notion of making a, a deal with Britain. Yeah, they, were, they, they opposed the war, the, the war of 1812, which turned into a patriotic war, and the United States won it. So, ooh. You got on the wrong side of a winning war. That's very. That's very. That's, that's why Andrew that's, Jackson was so popular. That, that's right. New that's Orleans, right. wasn't it? That, no, he was a war hero. Yes, he <laughs> he uh, led led uh, the Battle of New Orleans uh, and and won that battle against the British, which was uh, in fact fought after the treaty was signed. But oh well. <laughs> they, the communication in those days was not <laughs> that, that quick. That's that's <laughs> correct. So so you have the demise of the Federalists. And, you, and what you have then is the transformation of the Republican Democrats, some of whom um, are, uh, you know, are more favorable to infrastructure projects and, and uh, capitalism and the growth of money and these kind, and others that are not. And so some of the Republican Democrats fall off of that and the others form a new party called the Democratic Party in 1832. And so that's the so so what we call that's the first party system the the Federalist versus the Republican Democrats, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, the second party system is the development of uh, the founding of the Democratic Party in 1832 by uh, Andrew Jackson and uh, Andrew Jackson and then Martin Van Buren. If you can bring up the next slide, then that's that's Martin Van Buren. There, this is one of the this is a daguerreotype. This is one of the first photographs it's taken. Photograph, yeah, yeah it's as an opposed to photograph. the others, which yeah. were. Oils, yeah. yeah, I mean, it would, be, would have been much better if he had had a painting, I think. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> he doesn't look so good there. Yeah. But Martin Van Buren is really the architect of the first official political party, uh, the Democratic Party. And uh, he's the one who develops the idea that actually uh, there's party loyalty among not just the leadership, but among the rank and file that you have, uh, you have uh, uh, an, or, an official organization. You have party conventions that choose the uh, the candidates. This is all brand new in the 1830s. Was loyalty to what though, or who? Right. Well, it's loyalty. Still, even then, it's loyalty to candidate, but it's also loyalty to ideas. You know, if you're against the national bank, then you're a Democrat. If you're a Western farmer, you're probably a Democrat. So it's an array of issues, not just yeah, yeah. one. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but it could be one leader. Uh, you're loyal to Martin Van Buren, for example, that yep. makes you a Democrat. Right, that's true because it could be, and certainly that's true with Jackson, less so with Martin Van Buren, who actually does serve a term as president in the late 1830s, but uh, it really, he didn't have much of a presidency. It's really, he's better known as the architect of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. In response to that, this, this group of capitalists and those who believe in infrastructure and stronger government, the, the former Federalists regroup and they form a new political party called the Whigs. And this goes back to the opposition Whigs in England, yeah. right? That's, uh, that's kind of a throwback What's to that. What's the significance of the use of the word Whigs? It's, it's, it's the word that was used for political parties in England. Okay. It's, it actually has and nothing to do with nothing anything. to do with the issues. No, the issues are quite different. Um, so, <laughs> what's in a name? Not much in, in in terms of political parties. So you have the development of the Whigs, who are in favor of infrastructure projects, and and they want, uh, uh, you know, they like the national bank. They favor state banks. They want investments in the economy to stimulate the economy, and uh, and so that's the Whigs. And so the second party system party system is the, the Democrats versus the Whigs. And, uh, you know, uh, 
economic development is a big issue because you have the development of uh, you have the early railroads in the 1830s and Erie 1840s, Canal. the Erie Canal. These are Whig projects. These are projects that Whig support. There's a <coughs> pardon me, a Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs. It's really the Eastern Seaboard is more Whiggish than it is Democrat. Uh, the inland areas, especially the Midwest with small farms, that's much more Democrat mm. dominated. Um, and so you have geographic divisions, but not complete. You do not have in the second party system a sectional party, which is just one section of the country. Well, in those have days, that uh, Manifest Destiny was, was getting whipped up, right? Right, People that's were true. were looking west. That right. would have been the Whigs, wouldn't it? No, actually, it's, surprisingly, it's not. No, I mean, the, the, the Democrats are the real expansionists because they support small farmers. Ah. Um, they, they want more farmland available. Ah. And, uh, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> they become the expansionist party. So. Interesting. Um, and the Whigs actually oppose this. It's one of the things that leads the, to the demise of the Whigs is the Whigs are in the opposition in the Mexican War. But they don't, they don't like expansionism. They, well, their biggest concern in the 1840s is the expansion of slavery. The Whigs are kind of, it's, it's become very complicated actually, but the Whigs, Northern Whigs are anti-slavery. They don't like uh, slavery. And uh, Southern Whigs are pro-slavery. They like slavery. This is so interesting. We're talking about political parties in the United States and the development of party systems through the 19th century right. with John David Ann, history professor at HPU. Right. John, uh, fix us now and yeah. the ramp up to the Civil War. Right, so that's right. So you have, so the first party system, right, is the Republicans versus, uh, pardon me, the Republican Democrats versus the Federalists. And so we've described that. So what happens in the 1830s is a transformation. As the economy grows, industrialism moves forward, and as the as settlers expand westward, then you have these trends in, in politics that begin to shift. Um, and so you have, uh, in 1832, you have the development of the Democratic Party. And uh, it's founded by a guy named Martin Van Buren. If we can bring Martin Van Buren up, uh, there's, there's Martin. He's coming. I know he's coming. There he is. Yeah. So Martin Van Buren, this is uh, actually a daguerreotype. He's, he's the founder of the Democratic Party in 1830. Mm. I, I grew up in Queens. There was a Van Buren <coughs> High School in Queens. Oh, yeah. So, I know right. about Martin Van That's Buren. right. So yeah. he is a New Yorker, um, <laughs> and he actually becomes pre Democratic president from 1837 to 18, 1841. So, but he's really the guy who founds the Democratic Party as an official party. I mean, now it's a party that has a constituency. It, ha it ha <coughs> pardon me, it has... Uh, conventions, it has, um, it has, uh, 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 you know, uh, torchlight parades and official or, uh, party organizations. So, uh, Van he wants Buren, to gather supporters. Yeah, yeah, Van Buren. These are all ways to gather supporters. That's right. So, Van Buren is the one who creates that. And, um, um, and then on the other side, the, the remnants of the Federalists are reformed into what's called the, the Whigs. And, and the Whigs are, you know, they're uh, pro-industry, they're pro-infrastructure, they, they support state banks, they support the national bank. So the, the differences become quite stark once Andrew Jackson, who is the president and who is a Democrat, begins to attack the national bank. Then the Whigs are very much opposed, the Democrats in favor, and so you, you have these issues, these new issues, which are, you know, laid out there and the parties compete on. So... So the, the, the second party system then is it, it originates out of the development of early capitalism and early industrialism. Mm -hmm. And for Democrats, the expansion of farmers westward. Then so, you go to the third party system. Well, we're not, we're not going to get to the third party no, system. I just want okay. to ask you when it began ah, okay, so we right. know when no, the right. second party system was so, over. So, so we, we can do that quite briefly. So, so essentially what happens in the second party system is the Democrats uh, have a, both a north and a southern constituency. But the Democrats, there's a lot of tension around the issue of slavery in the territories. Right, because Western Democrats, they're, they're, not, they're uncomfortable with the idea of slaves being brought into the new territories. Not, not necessarily for, you know, kind of progressive, idealistic notions about 
uh, slaves and African Americans, sometimes because they don't want African Americans to, they don't want to have to live next to African Americans, nor do they want to compete with the labor of even free African Americans. It's a labor Americans. question, yeah. So you have that tension in the Democratic Party, but you have even more tension in the Whig Party over the issue of slavery. And uh, between 1848 and about 1852, then you have some other issues that develop that really tear the Whig Party apart. So you have slavery in the territories, and northern Whigs do not want slavery in the territories. Southern Whigs absolutely want slavery in the territories because they're slaveholders. And then you have the issue of the new immigrants. Irish immigrants are probably the, the most important immigrant group in the 1840s, but you have this strong reaction against Catholics and Irish. And these guys are Northern Whigs. Uh, and the Whig Party is, uh, does, it, does not want to support this uh, anti-immigrant view. And so the Whig Party gets torn apart. You have for a short while the Know Nothing Party, which is the party of anti-immigration, which is mostly a Northern Party. Uh, early 1850s, they win elections in, uh, in Massachusetts and other areas of New England. Very short-lived, though. Uh, the, the, the Southern Whigs are now a bit adrift. They begin to move to the Democratic Party. Uh, the Northern Democrats uh, begin to drift away from the Democratic Party. And what you have by the mid-1850s is the beginning of sectional parties based upon the issue of slavery. So you have... Demo sectional means geographic. That's right. A, a division between North and South. You have the Democratic Party, which begins to dominate in the South. And in the North, you have a brand new party, which is created in 1855 and 1856 called the Republican Party. <laughs> and those are the two political parties that we have today. They don't stand for the same things, but that's essentially... The Democratic Party is created in 1832. The Republican Party created in 1856. And the Republican Party is the anti-slavery party. The Democratic Party is the party of slavery by the time of the Civil War. How interesting. So in the 1850s, then you have a new political alignment. One political party comes through the second party system into the third party system, the Democratic Party. But you have a brand new political party in the Republican Party. And, and that would be the beginning of the third uh, that's the th yeah, party that, system yes, in the United that's States. Right, this. And thus the end of the second party that's system. That's right. That's right. And next time we meet, John, <laughs> I would like to hear everything about the third party system <laughs> okay. because that's the one that's that, right. that still continues in its own way. Well, there are a lot, of, there, there are a lot of changes. But, yeah. uh, yes, it always yeah. changes. Kaleidoscopic, it's always changing. <laughs> and you've got to watch the changes. That's right. That's in, right. Including right now and today, you've got to watch the right. changes. That's right. That's right. That's why we're talking because I see these shifts taking place, and I think we could see new party formations in the future. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, John. Okay, you're welcome. John David and HPU, thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Aloha. <laughs>